I'm very excited to talk with Amy Martin about her book, Wild DFW, Exploring the Amazing Nature Around Dallas Fort Worth. Um, we'll get to questions at the end of the presentation. So I wanna start with in introducing Amy. A journalist and writer for over 40 years, Amy Martin sits on the Dallas County Open Spaces Trails and Preserves Program Board and serves as State Social Media Director for Native Prairies Association of Texas. She managed wildlife rehab, habitat rehabilitation on a private nature reserve in Northeast Texas for 12 years, including converting 15 acres of pasture into tall grass prairie. She was also the author of the biography of Ned Fritz, Texas's most famous environmentalist and natural preserver, the Ned Fritz legacy, which can be found at nedfritz.com. And you can also find her writings at moonlady.com. So I am going to turn it over to Amy and she's going to do a little presentation and then we'll come back at the end for questions. Well, it is just wonderful to be here. Um, <clears throat> Wild DFW was released on July 11th, so we're still sort of in the in the bloom of it all. I want to thank the Fort Worth Public Library for inviting me here. But uh, before I uh, launch into the talk, I wanted to point out some special guests because my talks are not just talks, they are community building activities. So we have, uh, right here, we have Bill Freiheit in the gray shirt, and he helped me with the, um, he is a, a Fort Worth naturalist, and he helped me with the plant section of the field guide. Next to him is Julie um, Thibodeau, and she runs, uh, she's the editor of um, Green Source DFW, we're on the senior reporter, and I will get back to it, and I did just set up an interview with um, Kyle Branch. Very so, good. Yeah. <laughs> and then behind them, in the green shirt, is uh, on the end, the green gray, that's Charlie Amos, and he, um, and this fellow over here, Zachary Chapman, in the dark, they were part of the Village Creek Drawing Beds of the Legacy Park chapter, and Charlie is the mover and the shaker in the Fort Worth Audubon Society. So if you have any questions about birds and how to get more active with birds, because the Fort Worth Audubon Society, even in the state of Texas, is kind of a legend, so is Charlie. Um, about um, just how active they are, how long they've been around, the excellent work they do, how great their website is. They're just, they just knock it out of the park, totally, completely. Um, over here in the blue sweater is Joanne Collins, and she's representing Native Prairies Association of Texas. Uh, she is a um, mover and shaker in the Fort Worth chapter over there, and she was part of the Brindrook Lakes chapter, Brindrook Lake Prairie chapter. Behind Joanne is Daniel Coughlin. And Daniel Coughlin was one of the book's primary photographers. If I needed a shot that involved many miles of hiking out into the deep woods where we had to risk alligators, snakes, and mosquitoes and everything else, I would turn to Daniel. So yeah, he took about a third, maybe a little more of the photos in the book. Uh, they are truly exceptional. And um, Back there looking for a seat, uh, and she should take me in your seat because he's a gentleman. Uh, or you can sit up here with uh, Zach. Uh, this is Suzanne Tuttle, and she's from the Fort Worth Nature. Uh, well, she was the director of the Fort Worth Nature Preserve, and she is here also representing the Fort Worth chapter of Native Prairies Association of Texas. So if you're curious about prairies, um, Joanne even has some teaching aids and has been teaching this young man here up front. And Suzanne can also answer any questions. We've got a walk of Denver Prairies coming up in a few weeks, and also a walk and talk of Tandy Hills Prairies, which is in Fort Worth, kind of on the eastish side of Fort Worth. So um, I'm very happy to have all these people here, and very happy to have some old friends here as well. Um, the first next, the first part of the book is the natural history and ecology. Of of North Texas, um, plus any topics like geology, weather at night, weather and nature at night, citizen science, making your backyard into a nature sanctuary. If you like geology, make sure you catch my ecotone talk, uh, which has been going over really well. 
The uh, middle section is a field guide to over 100 species of plants and animals, uh, you know, plants and flora, fauna, insects, fish, a little bit of everything. And there are excellent field guides out there that are available. So what I tried to do is have it full of tidbits that you can use to spice up party conversation. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like the, the distance between an alligator's eyes and inches equals its length and feet. <laughs> and the those suckers can run about 20 to 30 miles an hour. <laughs> so <laughs> they are generally not interested in eating you unless they're like a 10-footer. But um, it's good to know how fast they can eat you. Um, yes, they can. And they can swim really fast, too. Uh, and the final third is um, 25 hiking adventures. And what makes these different than other hiking books is that I took these hikes with the people who knew the area the best. And they were often people who volunteer and work with these places intimately. And they taught me things about places I've been too many times that I just had no idea. Next. So before I take you on a whirlwind tour of North Texas nature, here are a few glimpses to just kind of whet your appetite. This is sunrise at Big Spring in the Great Trinity Forest. It is very, very seldom open to the public. But the back of it will lead you to, to some of the wildest areas of the Great Trinity Forest. And look on my website for my walks and talks page. And sometime in the winter, I'll be leading some hikes. And we'll be basically bushwhacking to find the back of the spring. Because, well, you're not supposed to go, but you can go in the back. <laughs> <laughs> and see the springs and the big burrow and all this stuff. Next one. Around the corner is the Trinity River Audubon Center, and um, it's the water gardens. Really love the ponds there, which unfortunately are a bit dry right now. Um, that green around their eyes means that they're breathing. I just don't know how we turn that on. Mm -hmm. That's magic. You know. uh, next one. Here's a lotus leaf from under side. This is from the um, big lotus pond in Hagerman National Wildlife Refuge, and that photographer waded into the pond and got underneath the lotus leaf to get that photograph. Next one. North Texas is on the uh, central flyway and our home birds are graced with migrators every spring and fall and through the winter. And you can learn all about that in the migration chapter. Next one. But there is a lot of nature in your neighborhood. Um, got big trees, then you've got these scrubbies. If I say all, oh, it's very cute. Mm -hmm. Next, got a pool. Live near a creek or a river? Well, Mama Mallard may make it home for you. These mallards take up shop in this lady's backyard every year, and she's already bought a little ramp for them in every mm -hmm. So, again, oh, <laughs> next one. And wherever you live, you've got white winged doves. We just kind of moved out the morning doves, which is kind of sad, but here they are. And um, just kind of reminds you they are the emblem of peace. It's very lucky to get Nick to jar. Nick DiGennaro is my bird photographer. Next. So, um, next one. So, hiking the dirt trails I'm about to talk about saved my sanity and brought me back from the almost dead. On a rainy night four years ago in April, my car slid and slammed into a highway guardrail, which curled up like a sardine can, and fortunately landed not on my front windshield. Um, in the process, my head banged into the driver's side window, and I had never endured pain like that anywhere in my body before. Next. In the emergency ward of Big Bailey in downtown Dallas, doctors discovered that I had shattered my C2 vertebrae, or second cervical vertebrae. The injury is called a hangman's fracture for its death dealing capability. Half who infer it die like wet. Half are left paralyzed, sometimes paraplegic. I am part of the 2% that walk away. Next. A brilliant Baylor surgeon saved my life by sandwiching what was left of my C2 in between my C1 and my C3 and stabilized it with titanium rods and screws. A three inch slice of my pelvis was bone grafted to it. Next. 
So there was a problem with that. Glad to be alive, but one quarter of our balance comes from that pivot of C1 and C2. It's kind of like a gyroscope. It keeps your, keeps your world level. And uh, I essentially had to learn to walk again. I had to regain that 25% balance. So first I walked around my block, then up and down my driveway. I mean, first I walked around my house, up and down my driveway, made it around the block. And I had a number of naturalists who came and walked with me to try to make sure I didn't walk stumble in front of the car or something like that. And then I kept walking, we made it down to the park. And then I got a big guy to walk with me, my friend Mark, and he started walking on a green belt and I started walking on paved, on a mowed grass. And that was helpful. Um, next one. But it wasn't until I started walking on dirt trails with friends and colleagues that my balance began to return. Um, I was confined to a neck brace, which is kind of no way to live. And so the uneven ground of dirt trails, the slippery surfaces, the tripping hazards that you have to be aware of, and kind of recover from when you stumble over them, all of these challenged my ear's vestibular system. It's called vestibular retraining. And um, it learned and the lower section of my cervical vertebrae also learned how to move, how to adjust, and I began to get my balance back again, where I was pretty much no one can tell that I am balance challenged now. Next, <clears throat> and those trails were a big, are a big part of wild DFW. I am now a relentless advocate for dirt trails and their health benefits. North Texas, particularly Dallas, has far too few dirt trails. We pour millions into bike trails. There are seven times more hikers than bikers. And we want to know where our trails are. So um, I will be hitting the road next year, talking to a lot of cities and organizations about this that we need to. Actually, Dallas Park Department has a policy of not making any new dirt trails. We're, we're going to change that, okay? <laughs> we're definitely going to change that. Next. So let's learn about these places to hide. There's um, pretty much going to just tell you about dirt trails, just one paved trail. And uh, when I talk about North Texas nature tonight, I'm just talking about these four counties. Collin, Dallas, Denton, and Tarrant counties. Next. The breathe is to remind me to breathe. Okay. Uh, most of North Texas is along the forks or the main stem of the Trinity or one of its tributaries. So study this for a moment. This is our watershed. Every drop of water that falls will end up in one of these water bodies and ultimately end up in the Trinity River. The Trinity is much maligned and us unjustifiably so. People would repeat things about the Trinity River that might have been true in the 80s, but haven't been true for a very long time. The Trinity River was studied, the water quality was studied by UTA, and they found it was much cleaner than most people give it credit for. It is boating safe for almost its entire length. Actually, I think it's entire length. And it is swimming safe in certain areas. So that means the pollution is basically under control. Um, if it was dangerously polluted, the uh, Trinity River Paddling Trail, which covers almost the entire Trinity system, would not have been able to receive National Park Service status, which it does have, because the Park Service would have come down and tested the broad as well. Next one. So North Texas is an ecotone, and if you like this little section, you'll like my ecotone talk. Um, it, it segues the great eastern deciduous forest into the dry western plains, which have no trees, very few. Rainfall is really fairly consistent across the south and southeast part of the country, but it starts to drop off at the Texas border. An annual precipitation drops off one inch for every 20 miles you go west from Louisiana. That's kind of phenomenal. Next. 
So these are the three eco regions plus the post oak savanna to the east and the western cross timbers to the west that make up the segue. So it goes from a woods and savanna mix to prairie to cross timbers, which has prairie patches, to Grand or Fort Worth prairie to the cross timbers last stand where the trees are getting pretty short. So these ecoregions are greatly shaped by the bedrock that are underneath them. So Austin Shaw and some other uh, shales and marls and stuff, they give rise to the Blackland Prairie. Woodbine sandstone is what creates the Eastern Cross Timbers and so on. Next. So Texas has a, North Texas has a surprising amount of diversity. And the reason is because our bedrock layers are tilted. Each of these layers gives rise to a different kind of soil. Well, each kind of soil will give rise to a different plant community. And each plant community will then foster a certain community of animals and insects. Um, so this means that our diversity, if you count all those layers there, is basically tenfold. And the deeper layers are old. So this tilt brings time to the surface ranging from about 100 million years old, a little bit younger in the east side to 300 million years old on the west side. This all happened because East Texas sank at some point and everything went <laughs> So uh, in general, things get harder, higher, drier, and older as you go west. Next. The preface to the uh, DF, Wild DFW states, North Texas isn't widely known for its nature. This book aims to change that. Our nature is not over there in some remote wilderness. It's here, tucked away on the fridges of reservoirs, hidden along creeks and rivers, on the tops of rocky hilltops and floodplains, wherever development was unfeasible. Next. So North Texas is not what you might think of as a vista-driven landscape like California is or Utah. It's far more interesting and intimate, I think. As the opening chapter states, abandon the idea that prime outdoors means majestic mountains, deep canyons, and ocean views. North Texas nature fosters a profound intimacy that's best experienced close up. Nature here is not, it, it has unfolding layers that invite lingering exploration. Nature here is not a distant vista that you admire. It's something to immerse yourself in and become a part of, like it becomes part of you. Next. So let's explore North Texas nature. And we're gonna start with the three biggest preserves, all of which are on the Trinity River, and each has a variety of terrains that will satisfy anybody. Next. Next. <laughs> got to breathe. Got to breathe. I, I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to gush. I'm going to gush. I'm going to gush. It's a gush. Um, Fort Worth Nature Center and Refuge is where you take the new beings, particularly out of state guests. Two words alligators and bison. Okay. You know, it's a wild place, you know? It benefits from good management from Fort Worth Parks Department and lots of attention from the Cross Timbers Master Naturalists, all of whom are gallivanting around the cattle and at the end of time. Next, the refuge is located on Lake Worth in the northwest corner of Fort Worth itself. And the Lake Worth is an impoundment of the West Fort. At 3,600 acres within city limits, it's one of the nation's largest city owned nature centers. There's over 20 miles of hiking trails, and there's a lot of, let's just say, freelance hiking trails that you can go on, <laughs> like a service road, like I can tell you how to do <laughs> Next, there are at least um, six types of soil at the desert, and that creates a lot of diversity and variety of habitats. There's medium grass prairies and savannas, and they have lots of reptiles and rabbits and grassland birds and road runners. There are also the deep bottomland forests with immense trees and lots of big birds like these night herons 
and mammals. There are deeply ravine upland woods that are just loaded with deep, absolutely loaded. And there is a vast stretch of Western Cross timbers. And there's also a sprawling lotus marsh. Okay, Ford, finish that boardwalk. I won't go back. It's, 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 it's soft opened. It's oh. soft, there's a soft opening. Like you can go in now. It's not barricaded. Oh, thank you. Because <laughs> as Charlie Davis points out, it is underrated as a place to walk for women birds in their home right now. So uh, next, on the uh, vigorous Canyon Ridge Trail, the Civilian Con uh, Conservation Corps 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 <laughs> has a, a a lot of beautiful stonework that got the refuge historic status. And then you get great views of the lakes and you can rest a while there because you'll meet but the trail is pretty tough. Um, but I love the Cross Timbers Trail, which is across from everything else you done. Walk across the West Fork to get to it. And uh, hardly anybody hikes there. And there are wild turkeys. There are rumors of ring-tailed cats in the wood. Oh my God, that's exciting. And you can just disappear into the silence there. It was really magical. I, I would have liked the whole thing that Kate Morgan had already hiked me into the ground. And so my feet just gave up about halfway and I had to turn back. Next one. And next, you can breathe or take a drink. <laughs> so in Fort Worth, we're going to head northeast to Denton in the Clear Creek Natural Heritage Area. Who's been? Oh, y'all got to go. The rest of you got to go. You got to go. Oh, absolutely. Not after uh, rain. Yeah. <laughs> uh, it is 2,900 acres of Army Corps of Engineering land. The accessible part is on the west side of the Elm Fork. There are wetlands, riparian woods, prairie, upland woods, the creek, of course, the river's right there. It's got at least 10 miles of hiking trails. They've recently expanded it, so there's even more hiking trails, and it never stops surprising me. The attention that the Elm Fort Master Naturalist given it brings great results. Next. This uh, preserve hangs out. Next. Yeah, got there. Uh, rabbit tracks is right. Uh, it hangs out about halfway between Lake uh, Ray Roberts and Louisville Lake. And when the big rains come and they fill Ray Roberts, which is an immense lake, it's one of the biggest in the state of Texas. Uh, when it gets full, though, that water's got to go somewhere. And into the Elm Fork and on down in the Clear Creek Preserve, it goes. So it's a wet place, very wet place. Next. And the woods along Clear Creek itself at times are just, they're cathedral woods. The trees are so big and so glorious, um, jaw-dropping, gorgeous, lush understory, so many birds that you cannot hear a conversation with your hiking partner. Next, but you better roll in the log jam on the Elm Fork and Highway 360. It's not all big or it backs up the water all the way in Clear Creek Preserve. And there ends up being no division between the big wetlands and the river itself. We determined as we were standing there uh, that there was uh, fewer miles to go forward than to restep, retrace our steps and go all the way back. So forward we went. Um, and they had like pricey camera equipment and everything. The guy I'm hiking with knew the trail so well, he could actually tell me where the potholes were, <laughs> where all the hazards were. So that was, I was very lucky. And um, we got to got, go by interesting things like that floating raft of fire ants there, gave it a wide berth. <laughs> and also the balls of frog jelly, which are just basically floating balls of frog eggs. Next, and they felt really weird. I don't touch it. <laughs> um, so we're going to drop down the Elm Fork down into Lake Louisville, Louisville Lake Environmental Learning Center. Um, it is everybody shortens it to Lima, thank you. Uh, and it's at the base of the dam. It's got over 2,600 acres, white tailed deer, wild turkeys, rare uh, river otters, nesting bald eagles, rare songbirds and owls. It's got it all. You can even camp 
there. And they've been doing lots of night sky events because a Louisville educator is an astronomer. And it is totally cool to be there at night. So if they do an astronomy event, go ahead and rent a campsite and stay. Next one. So if you've ever been there, you've probably hiked the Blackjack Trail on the education center. But if you'll read the Wild DFW chapter, and I did again, it'll be completely different to you because this trail dips in and out of Eastern Cross Timbers and Black Lane Prairie, sometimes as fast as 10 yards. Boop, 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 boop. You track two different things four times, you know, in half a football field. Um, <clears throat> I had never noticed that before. And it's a great place to basically study the edge effect, you know, because there's more action where the edge is. There's going to be more species. Um, it is, um, let's see, where am I? Uh, it has a lovely creek with jet black damselflies, which you kind of have to stand there at the creek and then look for them because they're jet black. You know, but they're really beautiful. And there's an old barrel pit that the trail goes by. And it is an example of what we call go back land gone bad. That it was, they dug it up and took out the dirt and they dammed to the rose of the lake and they didn't manage what grew back. And as a result, it's darn worthless. Next one. So Leela has a, um, lot of um, wonderful wetness. There's a sprawling beaver pond where you can really, it's a really wild place to kayak. And sometimes there's like little gators running around. And there's a wet woods with exotic pitcher plant type plants. There's great access to the Elm Fork um, where the outflow comes out of the dam. There is the famous and justifiably so the Turin Marsh Trail. Ooh, that paragraph got a break. Um, and next one. Yeah, oops. What about the paragraph? That's dragged. Um, and there is a great access to the Elm Fork where the outflow comes out of the dam. So you can, and this is where the, the main road of Leela ends. And if you'll go there, you will see herons and egrets, and cormorants, and all kinds of wading birds. And it's great fishing for birds and humans alike. And let's just say that some of those birds really like to steal other fish. And so they like to steal them from the human fishermen and it becomes a terrific show while they kind of duke it out for who gets the fish, you know. Because the fish come out of this dam and water's so turbulent and they're kind of stunned. So it's easy fishing for humans and birds alike. Next one. Next. Spring Creek Forest Preserve in North Garland is sort of a scaled down version of the big preserves. It has riparian woods, upland woods, lines of the prairies, a little bit of everything. There's a unique mix of trees based on chinkapin oaks. And it was the great Ned Fritz who first identified this unique mix of trees, which is what got it saved. Uh, they call it a botanical museum. Um, it has a sweet amount of benches and tables so you can just sit and enjoy the preserve. And if you look for QR codes in the upper section, the far north section, you can aim your camera at it and you, it turns into an interpretive trail made by the North Texas Master Naturalist. Next one. The middle section is a little more developed and uh, it has a short paved trail. And in the chapter, you'll read how Preserve steward David Parrish stepped off the paved trail into this little rabbit warren of uh, convoluted dirt trails, and his whole body became a kid again. And I recommend this section of Spring Creek as a place to go and don't worry about being lost. Let yourself get lost, please. It's a great feeling. Just wander around, see where your feet take you. See where your little kid imagination goes, what's down there? And boom, let's go to the creek. And there's a car, there's a Bel Air. <laughs> you know, and get to look and see what critter, critters are living inside the Bel Air, which high school seniors we paint every year. So it's interesting to go see what it looks like this year. Um, so it's a it's a it's a magical place. It's just magical. Uh, next one. And the um <clears throat> Oh, and that was the one I was supposed to be talking to you about. All right, next one. 
And then there is the Southern section, which is way too overlooked. I call it a go wild section because finding the trail is kind of a, a, a challenge. And uh, but it is a uh, rich, low riparian woods. The trees there are huge, as you can see here. Um, there are oaks and pecans and chickens, and it's a great creek access. So if you walk where the trail comes close to the creek, look for a rope. And you can use that rope to go down into the creek, and it's so much fun to play in the creek down there. Next one. Okay, go on. The herd nature sanctuary in the beginning <coughs> is another preserve with a great amount of variety. And I recommend this for women who maybe might be concerned about hiking alone. No problem. Very high security place. Uh, it starts on a significant chalk escarpment, and as you go down the trails that go down the slopes, you'll notice how the ecosystems very suddenly change. And as you get down further to the bottom of the slopes, the trees get bigger, and next thing you know, you're in these low riparian kind of bottomland woods, very broad bottomland woods. There's two huge trees down there. They both have their own fan clubs. I'm serious, people love these two trees. Um, take pictures, they photo albums of them, it's real fun. They have a bench there where you just commune with the trees, with the big trees. Um, next one. And they have um, the most amazing um, boardwalk and astounding wetlands that are there. There's a huge rookery across the other side of the wetlands, but you get to watch the birds flying back and forth from it, and that kicks up, goes all, all throughout the summer. Uh, there's a very sweet bullfrog pond with bullfrogs as advertised. Uh, amazing bird action. A lot of birders go down there. It's like, bro, the door over there. It's so exciting, you know. But I mean, again, so much bird action, you cannot hear a conversation. Um, next one. Half of the herd is prairie, and most people don't realize that because they all talk about the woods and wetlands. Um, and all of that prairie is recreated one acre at a time, laboriously, mainly by volunteers. A lot of work and a lot of heart, and it's one of my favorite stories in the book is Dave uh, Porter and his quest to make these prairies. Um, because he loves grassland birds. He wanted a place for grassland birds. Uh, he's a great, great human being. Um, the preserve there is privately owned, which is kind of interesting and unusual. And it has this natural history museum that most people look at the building and they think, no, nah, there's nothing there. Go in. It is full of the most interesting stuff, spectacular fossil. They got a dinosaur down in the basement for some reason. Mm -hmm. It's a dinosaur. So, right? Who says no to a dinosaur? <laughs> no. It's there. Next one. Ah, thank you, Next. Sherry Cave Park Nature Preserve, uh, which used to be called Southwest Nature Preserve. It really captured my heart when I finally went there. It's a perfect example of Eastern Cross Timbers. You cannot get any better Eastern Cross Timbers anywhere. It's in really good shape because the Cross Timbers Master Naturalist worked the heck out of that place. Next, Hepar takes over an entire cuesta, which is a geologic feature that's a direct result of those tilted layers that I showed in the geology diagram before. So the east side is a long slope, just like that diagram, and it has these switchback trails. And every time you get to a new curve, you get a new view. And often you get to look down at the ponds and see birds doing stuff. It's just a beautiful hike. And uh, the west side, however, when you get to the top, the west side just drops off. Food just straight down. It's really phenomenal. It's like it's praising the western western sun, setting sun, and um, it is nearly seven hundred feet high. And that was also an indigenous spot that the indigenous people used to look for herds of bison, but also for invaders. Next one. So let's get our rock on in Dallas. Yeah. 
Next one. There we go. No, stay on that. Yeah. Uh, many are familiar with Cedar Ridge Preserve, uh, which is on a big Austin chalk escarpment that slices across the southwest corner of um, Dallas County. It is such a big escarpment that it actually moves the West Fork into an east-west path before it starts going diagonally. It has to go east-west and around the escarpment, then it goes back down. Um, it is, um, you can actually, if you go behind that pond, you know, all the trails kind of lead to this pond and go back and around again. And if you look at the pond and look at the dirt, you can actually see Austin chalk segue into Eagle Ford shape. You can see the finger blend back there. It's a phenomenal thing to see. It has to be dry enough to see it. That's what creates the vistas of this part of the county. People kind of wonder why is it this way? Well, that's because that is exactly where the Austin chalk meets the Eagle Ford Shale. The Eagle Ford Shale erodes much faster, and so you get the vistas there. Next one. So all too overlooked, and this is what the chapter in the book is about, is the preserve's magnificent prairies. Tom Wilkins poured his heart into these prairies. And if you look beyond the trees that are lining the, the core trails that go down to the pond, you will be rewarded with spectacular wildflowers, fields of basket flowers, fields of echinacea and yucca, and all this beautiful, spectacular stuff. This place is a major hiking destination. It gets super crowded. It was intended to be a bird preserve. And it's run by the Dallas Audubon. It gets 600,000 visitors a year. And it's volunteer run. And most of those visitors don't donate. And that's a theme of the book's chapter. Um, it's, it's a struggle. It's a real struggle. Next one. So you'll get a much quieter experience of the um, Southwest Escarpment at the Dogwood Canyon Audubon Center, which is just across the farm to Market Road. It'll give your legs a workout if you try to go to the plateau top, the canyon top, but you'll see more birds and wildlife. They consider it a sanctuary. And it's quiet enough to meditate and force bathe in. And you can take the trail to the Canyon Plateau for one vista after another. Cedar Ridge has two vistas and they both look at the same thing. You go across the dog again, you get six different vistas, six different things. It's very cool. Next one. They have put in a new trail, SNS Trail Services, and it spins off about halfway up this trail that leads to the plateau top. And it takes you directly in to the dogwoods that bloom every March and into early April. And then after you see the dogwoods, um, there is a, the tree, the trail follows this creek. It's really beautiful. Again, so much bird action that you cannot hear a conversation on the trail. So it's good. Shut up, enjoy. You know? um, it is really some of the best songbird action around. And Quite possibly the nasty pair of golden cheek warriors this year. <laughs> quite, quite possibly. It's really exciting. Um, so it is um, to bird nerds, it, it was just huge, huge, huge news, Texas wide news. Next one. If you want more escarpment, you can get your rock on the Piedmont Ridge and Pleasant Road. Lovely views of the northern end of the Great Trinity Forest, which most people don't realize goes up that far. Um, it's in three parts. Uh, the Cyan Overlook in the north will provide vistas all the way to Cedar Hill. And Native Americans loved and used these woods a lot. They had a special cedar grove there for lodge poles. They had a special black walnut grove that they had planted there for food. And they used the overlook there for detecting invaders and also looking for herds of deer and bison. It's very close to Cyan Road, which itself was an old bison path because there's a low spot where they can cross on Light Pine Creek there. Next one. And this whole area is also a pioneer historic area. It's tied to the J.J. Beeman Trail. He was basically one of the founders of Dallas that nobody talks about. Um, 
it uh, goes through these beautiful low woods that are just intensely quiet and restorative. And then, whoa, the dark train comes through. And you're like, what the, what that? <laughs> and then it goes back to being quiet again. So just kind of bear with it. Um, there's a middle section that's south of the golf course. Yes, the city cleared in hundreds of acres of great trade forest. So then a golf course we did that twice, actually. Um, and this middle section is like this really narrow ridge. And it goes through, you get up there and you're thinking you're going to see forest. And there's prairie up there. There's prairie up there with some really nice flowers. Um, and it is, um, and also has some very nice vista spots. And you might go up there and you'll think, what's wrong with these red oaks? They look wrong. They're stunted or something. Well, they're buckwheat oaks. They also call them, they have a couple other names for them as well. And they're really cool. The little red oak leaves are like, not that big. They're so fun. Uh, next one. And like I was mentioning, this whole area is very rich with uh, Native American uh, history. And the third section, which is off this funny little neighborhood park, um, is the Comanche storytelling place, which is really rather famous. Um, it is so evocative. I've been there before when the full moon lights up this series of limestone terraces. And you go, oh, I can see stories were told here totally makes sense. And if you go, it's just a half a mile trail. And if you go to the very end of this trail where it ends at the dark line, you'll see this squatty oak, that little buckley oak I was talking about. And it's particularly kind of gnarly looking. And you'll think, what's this about? Well, it is part of the Comanche history record. It is one of there, it's not a marker tree, but it is considered a historic tree in their lore. And it was basically the, well, just imagine the stories that it's heard, you know, and, and it has been, um, it could be as much as 200 years old, maybe more. Steve Hauser has certified it and writes quite a bit about it in his uh, Comanche uh, marker tree book. Next one, and it is one of the oldest trees in Dallas for sure. Okay, let's get on to prairies. Next one. I like prairies. I like prairies a lot. I think they're under underappreciated. Wild well, Kept W covers the um, Isles of Road unit of uh, Ray Roberts Lake State Park. It's the only lake I'll swim. It has got a really low E. coli level. It's got some nice uh, sandy beaches and everything. And it has vast stretches of excellent prairie. Um, there are white-tailed deer everywhere. You just walk these prairies and you'll see them just dotted around in the grass. And if you can't walk much, just take a drive through the park. There are white-tailed deer everywhere and beautiful wildflowers in the spring. Next one. Right in the middle of this forest, however, this park is a patch of pine forest. What? Nobody can figure out how it got there. Um, Nature kind of laughs at our definitions, you know. We think we got it all figured out, and then it throws us a bone like that, you know. Um, it has got um, miles and miles of sunny hiking in the park, perfect in winter, nice vistas of the lake. South of the park is the Greenbelt Trail, which will lead you all the way along the Elm Fork to the tip of the uh, Louisville Lake. Make sure in both of these places that you take the equestrian trails. And those equestrian trails will get you closer to nature and will take you farther and deeper than the pedestrian trails will. Next one. Uh, back to prairies in Northeast Collin County is Park Hill Prairie. We're going to be hanging out there this weekend and watching the eclipse. So if you feel like joining us, uh, the preserve is over 300 acres, but right in the middle of it is a 50 acre Blackland Prairie remnant. And uh, it's being managed by Brandon Belcher of the Climber Meadow. And you take this mode trail through the restoration area, they're trying to expand it, to this ridge top, and then the remnant just spreads out before you. And you look at it, and all the rest of the park has disappeared. And you think, oh my God, this is what all of North Texas used to look like before development. It used to look just like this. 
Brandon didn't want any pay, uh, pass mode in Remnant because he felt it would invite invasive. And so there's no trail, so just go walk in. Just wander through. And, you know, the, the key to a prairie is not only its vastness, but to get down on your hands and knees and look at that top, that bottom 18 inches. It is as rich and as thick as a rainforest. Just gorgeous. You will find the most interesting plant just kind of weaving their way through all of those grasses. We found, um, I forgot what it was, but it was red and we ate it. Mm -hmm. It's very fun. Um, so I love Park Hill Prairie. Uh, next one. And you can go a step beyond. There's a, there's a Chris Emery photo. He's in the back. Yeah. He took a lot of the Fort Worth photos and also a lot of the skies and, and the stars. Um, there are Fort Worth prairies on uh, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers land on the east side of Pembroke Lake. And you know, you go well, maybe 30, 40 yards in, and it's totally high in the air. You know, again, you get to experience what that part of North Texas looked like before development. You know, the Chisholm Trail used to cut right through there and listen for the echoes of everything that used to go on there. And you just kind of disappear into time. But sadly, this parcel is no longer in existence. It's now a college campus. Next one. We tried. They tried. Um, well, you tried really hard. Oh, I tried. <laughs> we all tried. All the boys tried. Um, so you get a different prairie experience at Tandy Hills, which is in Fort Worth. Uh, natural areas. It's got these hilltop prairies, but make sure you do the right prairie and use to sort of rich, wonderful. Uh, it's just a wisp of soil on top of hard limestone. Um, and yet the wildflowers could not be more abundant. It is definitely the best wildflower displays in uh, North Texas, but don't you go pop in any confetti bombs for a gender reveal party or set up some professional photo shoot trampling his wildflowers or go off trail and do other, some other kind of nonsense because Don Young and his volunteers will have a pretty stern word with you. And, and if you do something really wrong, they'll call the cops on you. And the cops will come out, you know, which is a testament to their persistence that this place should be saved and treated well. Next one. Can you believe that there are prairie remnants in the middle? I'm not joking, in the middle of laying up. There's big ones too. This is an Oak Point Nature Preserve. A uh, concert operator tried to put an amphitheater on top of those prairies. Carol Clark was not having it. I mean, this tall. He was not having it. And by God, they did not do it. They held a concert, kind of trampled the prairie, decided that they, you know, they gave up on it and went away. Um, wonderful, wonderful prairies. Next one. And here's Sunrise at Connemara, Merrow, Con Connemara Meadow Preserve in Allen. These amazing volunteers are creating a patch of prairie at a time. And they're marching up this hillside, taking seeds and plants from one patch and putting it into the next patch and putting it into the next patch. It's an amazing operation, truly something to see, very dedicated. And we'll be doing a hike there at the end of the, kind of towards the end of October. It'll be a lot of fun. Next one. So kind of just a graph basket of some of the ones that didn't fall into different categories. Next one. Bob Jones Nature Center is a lovely piece of Eastern Cross Timbers, which by the way, we're having like lots of rains and they will come back for the first time. Um, the sandy soil of Bob Jones is a great place to hike after a rain. No mud, it compacts the sand, easier to walk. Um, the trails of Bob Jones Nature Center connect to the Walnut Grove National, National Recreation Trail, which goes all along the shores, the southern shores of Lake Grapevine. And um, something to understand or remember is that Lake Grapevine, Lake Vaughn, and Lake Louisville along their inlets have terrific trail systems. They're not in the book, but it's a great place to go looking for hiking places. 
Next one. There is wild at White Rock Lake if you know where to look. Um, the chapter has a terrific map that will just basically point out all of the different wild places. It has a terrific pollinator garden, which they put out an alert amongst all the bird photographers. This is where you've got to go get the hummingbirds. I mean, it was wall to wall photographers for a while. They were having to like get out of each other shots and stuff because, you know, it was just so full of flowers that all of them were like all of them were. Um, and it was, um, there is um, the colonnade garden. There are benches for contemplation on this map, and there are docks for watching the moon rise. They're, they're on the west side of the lake, and you can watch the moon rise over the, the, the lake, and it's just beautiful. And all the docks are full of lunatics. And so this wonderful community of moon watchers develops, and there's usually people necking and stuff. <laughs> uh, but they don't mind. They don't mind us. Next one. Um, River Legacy uh, Center in Arlington is a great place to introduce. Where's my River Legacy, my Villagewood drawing bed photo? I'm going to have to get that in there. How could I miss that, Charlie? Oh my God. Um, the River Legacy Nature Center in Arlington is a great place to introduce kids to nature. It has wide, well maintained trails, and the Nature Center has a really good introduction to the Trinity River and more. Uh, next one. The uh, Wild DFW has one chapter on float trips, and uh, this is on the West Fork in Arlington, which is a surprisingly wild section of the Great Trinity uh, of the Trinity River. And it also has info on the Trinity River Patent Trail, which is a national water trail in the national park system. Next one. Go ahead. So the Great Trinity Forest. 6,000 acres are Dallas's greatest and most neglected natural assets. I get more questions about the Great Trinity Forest than any other place. How can I experience it, they ask, and I say it ain't easy, and that's by design. If you can't access the place, you won't care about it. There you go. Wild DFW is the only place that gives you detailed instructions on how to access the Great Trinity, uh, the Great Trinity Forest. Next, the easiest way is to just jump into the Trinity River Audubon Center's Forest Trail. It's apart from all the other trails, so you'll often have it all to yourself. So it's easy for people who are curious about the forest, but they're kind of nervous about nature because the trails are really wide and well maintained. And that oak, uh, that country there is, I think it's 200 years old. Anyway, it's one of their landmarks. Next one. But thanks to volunteers from the um, um, on the entrance road to the center is the trailhead for the Trinity Forest Trail. That's the one on the upper right, on the upper right, whatever the direction is to you. Um, if you go on this trail, it's okay. So you can go on business clothes and you know it's easy. Uh, one way goes to the Trinity River. And you can actually take a bridge over the river. It is very rare to have a pedestrian bridge over the river. And the other way it goes deep into the forest. But if you know what to do, and Wild DFW chapter will tell you, there is an unmarked trail that you can take to Elam Creek, and you can go into some of the safe areas of the McComas Bluff Preserve. Really beautiful forest. Next one. But thanks to volunteers from the North Texas Master Naturalist and others, the natural trail segments of the Ned and Jeannie Fritz Texas Buckeye Trail are rocking once again. I took some television reporters there and they were completely blown away. You're 10 minutes from downtown and there's this deep forest serenity. And I told them, go down there to this barn and there's like white tailed deer and elephants and all kinds of stuff. And they just couldn't believe that we have this unknown natural asset. Next one. And if you're willing to go wild, which Daniel and I have done many times, um, there is lots of off-trail wandering through what we call the Bonton Woods, 
And there's plans for new trails are being developed through that area, which will take you to the confluence of the White Rock Creek and the Trinity River, but it will also take you all the way around, so it'll be about six, eight miles of trail to the Bonton Park Pond, which we're calling the Bonton Pond out of respect to the community, but most people call it Bart Simpson Lake because it looks like his head if you look at it on Google Maps. <laughs> and it's, but it's their community. They want to call it Bonton Ponds. We're going to back them up on that. Next one. But my favorite trail on the Great Trinity Forest, and I took I took twenty hiker bags on it, and only got a, lost twice. So I'm proud of myself. <laughs> it's the Holland Trail, and it's made by equestrians from the Texas Horse Park, and uh, it is a near perfect example of the Great Trinity Forest. There are practically no invasives there. There are huge trees. You can tell that it wasn't overly ranched, overly farmed. Uh, and you can, if you know the uh, cedar elm, anyway, if you know the little trail off to the side, it will take you to the uh, confluence of the White Rock Creek and the Trinity River. And that is the heart of the Great Trinity Forest. Next one. And the last part of the Great Trinity Forest going south is a large chunk between a river and a dike in an industrial district. But once you're over the dike, you're in this world and you won't even notice that there's a concrete crushing plant right around the corner. And uh, you can disappear for days into miles and miles of trails. And if you ask Joe Johnson nicely, he'll let you go there at night. He takes you along. Uh, there's huge trees, huge trees. Pileated woodpeckers. There's tremendous river views with lovely benches that you can just sit there and watch the river flow, which is just such a great gift. And it was a week ago on Thursday that we voted, and we have Dallas County Open Space has doubled the size of Oak Island. It is going to be about five hundred and fifty. I'm so excited. Yeah. Uh, Joe Johnson's going to have to get busy and make some more trails. <laughs> Next one, our last section. Um, we are so lucky to be on the Central Flyway, and we get uh, water-loving birds like uh, waders, shorebirds, and waterfowl. And as Charlie Amos taught me, you know, when birds go south for the winter, this is the south. So <laughs> we are fortunate to be home to them. And uh, the Village Creek drying beds, right? Oh, there's the pictures of it. Yeah, I didn't forget. Because uh, those are Daniel's pictures. They're just so gorgeous. You can really see how it's just a lost world in there when there's water. It's pretty dry right now. Um, but um, it was once when the water was more consistent. Uh, it was once one of the very top burning places in Texas and really was known nationwide. Um, it is um, it is just a, a lost world in there. Be there in the fall and winter after we get a couple more rains. Choice. Next one. You can get uh, more water birds plus river otters, spotted gar, and more at the John Bunker Sands Wetland Center in Cedarville, where there's a lot of hiking opportunities on. It's a series of wetland cells, and there's little dikes, and you can walk all of those dikes, and people don't realize that you can, and you get really close to the birds that way. Um, and then also, if you get on the, one of the sides, you can like see the nesting bald eagles from there, and that's fun. You gotta take your binoculars, but they're there. Next one. So you take that, multiply it by thousands, and you've got Hager, the National Wildlife Refuge, out of region on Lake Texoma, um, but I had to include it. I just had to include it. Tens of thousands of waterfowl and other birds over winter there, attracted not just by the abundant fish and crustaceans, but also being a good host. The refuge puts out like 100 acres, I think, of grains for these birds to eat. So yeah, it's a real popular place. It comes with dinner. Um, and it is, um, um, if you've got somebody who loves birds but can't walk anymore, well, they've got Saturday band tours, and that will take you all over 
the preserve. And also they've got a self-guided auto tour, which is, uh, there's a little construction issue, but it's gonna be even better when they finish with the construction. And uh, another great way to get to know the preserve, it is 16,000 acres. So getting a little orientation first is kind of helpful. You also get the interesting history of how it came to be. There's a great visitor center with a quarter acre pollinator garden, which is huge. When I first started going there, that visitor center, which is now this beautiful architectural building, was this rickety trailer on a hilltop. And a group of volunteers and the Blue Stem Master Naturalist dug in and said, this is our place. We have ownership of this place in our hearts. And they took raw land and made it into a naturalist paradise. It's really an inspiring story. Next one. And um, I have to stress though, oh yes, um, and Hagerman is great even after the water birds have departed. It's um, miles and miles of trails. You'll often be the only one on them. Some are along an old raised railroad bed, so they're flat, but it's also raised. So you're up there in the tree canopy and can get closer to the birds. There's other trails that climb significant bluffs and hills. Um, or they meander through a little series of ponds that has a bunch of bird lines on it. Um, there's um, it's it's just delightful there in the off season. Next one, and next, I'm at the end. Uh, but I have to stress that while DFW is not a book about land, it's a book about people. Many of them right here in the room. Um, each chapter begins with a personal vignette that places people in the middle of nature, enjoying it, and sometimes preserving it, because we're a part of nature. We belong in nature. Next one. All throughout the book, there are stories about these fine folks, people who love insects, birds, mammals, reptiles, and more so much, prairies, woods, that they learn everything about them and are enthusiastic about sharing how many texts did you get from each other? <laughs> and then also got lots of texts from me. And um, I consult with a lot of professional experts, like from Texas Parks and Wildlife. I learned the most from these guys, really and truly. Next one. And this book is a uh, love letter to all who aid nature. These are the kind of people who plant trees, they'll never sit under the shade of them. You know, their altruism just absolutely floors me. As the book states, it's a gift to learn about nature, but to preserve it, now that's true legacy. Next one. And you'll discover people in this book that found deep personal healing from immense loss, from autism and ADD, from physical ailments, and they found it through nature. Nature is more than outdoor recreation. It is essential for our physical and mental health, and it should be funded that way through those mechanisms. Next one. So, next one. I hope I have enthused you about North Texas nature. Um, nature has no expectations of us. It's not impressed by us. It wants nothing from us. It has nothing to sell us. Being in nature helps us find the core of who we are. And often relationships that you make with people while you're out with nature become very deep and long lasting. Um, it really is a neutral environment. And that is just an amazing gift to us. Next. And if you visit the, web, uh, the website for the book, wild-bfw.com, interesting story about that dash. And you can go to the community page. Everything that I have mentioned today, most of the people, all of the places, all of the groups will have a clickable link on the community page. There's also a page for all of our wonderful photographers and you can find links for them. Daniel is with um, Fine Arts. Uh, Chris Emery has Sundog photo Art Photography and you can explore even more of the stuff that they have to offer. Um, there's also um, Wild DFW pages at uh, Facebook and Instagram. And I not only post about my talks and stuff, but I post about all the groups that are mentioned. And so you get this great 
rolling snapshot of what this community in this book is and how alive it is and how it's always doing things and doing things that you can participate in. Um, and if you'll see the walks and talks page at wilddfw.com or dash dfw.com, um, uh, you can find more of my talks. I've got a number of different talks. Uh, if you like geology, you'll like the ecotone talks. Next one. And I am happy to answer questions. The fire hose of words is over. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> All right, so we are going to open questions. And can you guys, yeah, there we go. Okay. For those of you who are online, if you post your questions in the chat, we'll read them out. For those of you who are in the room, I'm going to get to the microphone so everybody who's online can hear your question. But I'm going to start with one of mine. And then we'll talk questions. So you mentioned it briefly when you talked about how the out. Can you talk a little bit? <clears throat> Battery. Um, can you talk a little bit about citizen science? And we ask you to use for that. Yes. Citizen science was a very fun chapter. Um, there are a series of wild books that Tiffany Press has published. Started out with Wild LA. Um, I was the second one commissioned, but it took me a long time to turn it in. Uh, so Wild Philly came next. There's a Wild Miami. We just released Wild Houston, which is very cool. Uh, there's also a Wild someplace in Utah. So they gave me a format to follow that I was able to customize for this area. And one of the things they said we needed to do was citizen science. So everybody is familiar, most people are familiar with iNaturalism, which is this app, and when I'm Zach over here, there's an iNaturalist legend for, he's in the book for how many things he's done, what we bought from Kenan uh, from the Fort Worth uh, Botanic Garden, Brit is in there about it. Um, but there is a lot more citizen science than iNaturalism than you might think. There are bird counts that we go into details about that anybody can participate in. And these bird counts are very, very important. There's dragonfly counts, there's ladybug counts. There's also, you can participate in citizen science by weather stations. Weather stations have become very important for weather um, predictors and weather than people to, um, particularly for rainfall. By studying your weather state, particularly weather underground, they can look at it and look at an idea of the micro rain spots. Basically, what areas of Dallas are getting more rain than others? What areas of Fort Worth are getting more rain than others? Um, there are dark sky citizen science. It's an amazing amount of ways that you can participate in feeding data to um scientists and not only scientists use it but like your iNaturalist observations are what people like me are going to park boards or going look at all the people and views of nature and they're not recreationalists they're naturalists look at them out there and those some trade-offs all right next question I have a question for you about uh, forest bathing. Yeah. I've got a mental picture of it, but I'm sure there's a better <laughs> picture. <of> it. <laughs> it is um, basically going slow and appreciating nature with all of your senses. There's a lady, um, she's very French, she was French, she has a very French name, that teaches this. And it is um, like when I go down the trail, the, what I try to do when I'm a few, you know, 50 yards in or so, is I stop and I close my eyes and I try to hear as much as I can because it takes about two minutes. But two minutes of closing your eyes, your ears do open up. And what I tell people is that we need to listen to layers. In a forest, you need to listen low. You need to listen to mid-range, like 
coyotes sniffing through, silently, and you need to listen up in the canyon. So that's part of horse fame, is learning to listen to your horse. I tell people to um, kind of chop their nose and breathe through their mouth and then open their nose and breathe through both. And what they'll notice is that they're picking a sense to the horse that they weren't otherwise picking up. To just spend some time in the forest and notice how different the wind is in the forest. How the trees kind of break it up into little micro currents. And so you, know, you can look and see how this tree over here is responding to a wind that is definitely different from this tree over here. You can tell by the way the leaves are moving. Or to just spend some time noticing the shadows and what's going on. Another exercise is to try to figure out where the rain flows. Where's the rain going? Sometimes it's a little hard to find if there's a leaf litter on top of them. And then to just spend a lot of time just sitting. I had this conversation with the type of it. And I said, you know, before I take you on this tour, you need to know something. I'm not a distance hiker. I'm not all about elevation changes. I'm going to take you slow, and I'm going to hope that you experience it. And I'm going to stop, you know, I'm going to point out things that you think are really nerdy. But I hope that they bring you a little closer to nature when you notice that, hey, this, this is a burrow that leads to somewhere. So if that's a burrow, where's its exit? This one where it comes out. Do you see this little leaf that's rolled? What's its type of leaf? Well, that's a kind of leaf. It's in there. It's made a little calculator. Why is there this sunny space in the middle of the forest? Well, think about it. And I was able to teach them about what's in a forest, which is called the general ponds. And these are low spots in the forest that will fill up with water. And when the water drains, they generally stay bare of plants. Most people just walk by them and they don't think about this. But those with general ponds are the backbone of uh, the forest feeding system because they fill up with crustaceans, crawdads, and things like that. And that's where everybody goes to eat. The raccoons and the possums and the coyotes, everybody likes to be high. So um, that's what forest bathing is about, is really getting to know the forest with all of your senses. Uh, people don't realize that you have proprioceptors that are on your joints. And so these are people who are athletes or dancers, they have very refined appropriate receptors because they know the appropriate receptors tell your body where they are in space and time, where it is. So if you can do this, that's your appropriate receptors telling you how to direct your hand to your nose, even though that you can't see it. So if you think about your appropriate receptors, it's kind of, you know, when you're in the forest or, or prairie, and you're in the prairie too. And just go, where are you? Just be my sixth sense. See if you can tell me more about this forest than I can see, hear, taste, smell, or touch. And then, by all means, if you know your plants, touch them. Mm -hmm. They're fascinating textures to the leaves. Memorize what poison ivy looks like, memorize what metals looks like, and then touch to abandon. And you will find that what you thought was chip or plants becomes plants that each plant has a different texture. Each plant has a different bark to it. That, that, and I tell people this is that it's a forest bay, it's an exercise in ending your plant plants. You know, because people seem to see a wall of rain, even hikers, they're just walking through rain, they just walk rain. It's like, no, no. Stop and tell me how many shapes of leaves do you see in this area right here? You know, and, and all of a sudden, forest becomes alive to you. But also, forest release a certain kind of chemical that, um, and this has been studied like excessively, which you can't, they have lots of studies about this, that forest release. All plants do, of course, in particular because of the size of the plants. 
release a certain kind of chemical that awakens your immune system. And so in Japan and in Canada, if you're having immune system problems, like you've got an autoimmune disease, it's very hard to do. You can get a prescription for forest banking. And it, it tells you, you must go out to the forest and spend two hours, three times a week, and then they'll charge it and see how your health is improved. Shouldn't we have that here? You know, it would not be cheaper than hospitals. Totally. And Dr. Craig. <laughs> Anybody else? Hi. Hey. So I know the book we talked a little bit about hay trails versus dirt trails and, and mild versus wild. I think for the most part, you know, I'm really curious as to something you said, I think, in one of your previous um, talks, which is how do you how do you get that person who doesn't want to get a lot of nature on them <laughs> into this more you know forest bathing and getting off of the paper? How do you how do you recommend that that person you know start? Yeah, I um, the adventure session starts with, and most people kind of just flip right through it because it's like I want to know where it goes, you know. But there is three pages, well, actually ends up being about six pages of advice. And it's directed to those people. How do you dress? How do you pack your pack? What do you do that will make your visit to nature a much more comfortable? So one of the first things I tell people is dress like this. Wear gloves in each shirt. Wear it open over a tank top if it's too hot. But I don't go into a forest without a long sleeve shirt. I generally also unroll the sleeve so that they're down to my uh, wrist. I tell people to wear gloves. Wear gloves. Wear leather gloves when you go out into nature, into the forest. And that way you'll feel a lot more, you'll, you'll touch things and you won't be so worried about it. Also, I am just shocked that people will remember their gloves for they will remember their sunscreen, but they will not put on poison hiding very food. And this is a godsend. This is a staple of forestry people. Use this. It's been tested. It really works. It's made of a polymer that has actually been in hairspray for many decades, so they know it's safe. And so they, they put the screen, it's called an IPX pre-contact solution. And you put it on here, let it dry for a few minutes, it dries clear. And what happens is that the poison ivy originally will feed on the top of that curtain. And so it's not going to go into your skin. Then you don't get it in people. And you watch out about touching, you know, these areas that you protected from it. But what I do is I put it on a gap between my shirt and my um, um, uh, gloves. I put it on my ears. We stick it with hair and always put poison on the on. Put it on my face. Um, and I put it, if I've got a gap right here, I'll put it right here. Um, and that will, getting people over there fear of poison is a big part of it. I also recommend people that if they put something in the inner pack, pack that allows them to sit, you know, that allows them to catch their breath, to sit down and experience nature, even if it's just a towel. I take a very lightweight picnic blanket and I shove that into my pack so that the people I'm taking along with me on the hike, we can all just sit down and blanket it together and catch our breath. Or sometimes people, we we'll get out in nature and they'll realize that it's a little bit on the body. And so sometimes their back gets a little excited about it. And so I'm able to lay them down on their back and stretch it out a little bit. So I think that's a, a lot of it. 
Also tell me, people, as soon as you go back home after being in nature, take a shower. Mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> wash off your chiggers, wash off your little spiders. Although I try not to tell them about spiders. <laughs> <laughs> I also try not to tell them that the trees are full of snakes. So. <laughs> <laughs> um, but um, yeah, there, there's a way, and, and then somebody asked me the other day, how can we best save the blue corner of Denton to try to develop? And I say, it's taking on diet drugs. These people who are concerned about nature want you to take them there. They want you to lead them through. They feel safer with you. And then once they realize, oh, I really because he can stand there, it's too much like to a part for a part and keep doing so at the time. Right now, you can do it. If they're able to um, uh, see that it's okay, then go back and that's why I plant you need a lot of pipes, particularly through the winter when the poison ivy is west, so that people can start to get to know these places and like go to Island. When you and I are going to do go to Island like in in November, we're going to get a lot of people who have been really curious about go to Island and they're like, mm, that's South Dallas, I'm kind of here. Mm, that's Trinity. There's hogs and well, the first thing I do when I take people in the Great Trinity Forest is tell them, you know, like seven people have been killed in the last couple of decades by hogs, and they were all hunters who kind of hacked off the hogs. You know, otherwise, hogs. So that's tough. All right, so since the library is closing in 10 minutes, in okay. case you guys might want to buy uh, books from Amy, I think we're going to call it there. Um, and so I just want to thank everyone for coming tonight. I hope you enjoyed the discussion. That be fun tonight. I barely remember. We'd love for you to join us next Saturday. October 21st at the Ridgely Branch for a discussion with George Bristol to talk about his new book on the 100th anniversary of Texas State Parks. Uh, um, and you can visit our website, forwithlibrary.org, for more information. Thank you. Thank you.